Welcome to Supply Chain Horizons, a video podcast series that looks at crucial issues facing global supply chain teams. This video podcast is sponsored by Logility, a leading provider of supply chain solutions used by more than 1,250 companies in more than 70 countries around the world. My name is Chris Russell, an executive with Logility, and I would like to share with you some interesting conversations that I've had with a variety of supply chain experts. Today I'm talking with Bill Simpson of Supply Chain Systems, and Bill has over 30 years experience in supply chain, most recently has been forecasting and consulting for a variety of consumer goods companies. We've been talking over the last couple of weeks about the impact of variability in your lead times. And it sounds like a pretty obvious thing, but in our conversations, we've discovered that it's fairly nuanced and we've got some strategies on, on A, how to figure it out and B, how to do something about it. So what's the challenge of an inconsistent lead time? What are you seeing in the field? Well, one of the big things we're seeing is there's a lack of understanding of what lead time means uh, because it impacts uh, cycle time. It impacts costs, it impacts in-stock position, and it impacts sales. But in a lot of cases, companies don't understand that. Typically, the people that are in charge of lead times that are negotiating with vendors don't fully understand those costs. It almost creates hidden buffers in the supply chain because inventory starts to crop up in strange places to cover that, or, or safety lead time. Uh, it can be that. It also can be the opposite. It can be uh, out of stocks. Now, more often than not, people will overestimate the amount of lead time because they feel that the buffer will help them. But, yeah, their inventories are going to start to explode when they do that. And in some cases, I've seen they add a day for internal processing, they add a day for warehousing. Before you know it, you got an extra week worth of lead time as a buffer. And when you start to look at what that cost is, it's huge. Conversely, if you are overly optimistic about what the lead time should be, and you, let's say you have seven days too short of lead time, you're going to run out of stock, and the CEO right. is not going to be hitting the sales numbers. So it's a double-edged sword when it comes to managing lead times. What I try to talk to our clients about is consistency is the optimal. It doesn't have to be the lowest lead time. certainly doesn't have to be the highest lead time, but it has to be consistent. Once you have consistency, you can manage your supply properly. Right. So when you walk into a company, uh, what are some of the symptoms that you see that will point you to a problem with the lead times, both schedule adherence in manufacturing and, and procurement lead times from vendors? Yeah, the first thing I see is it's typically disjointed. So a buyer in a retail organization may be established in the lead times, but he's never tracking them. And it's the supply chain people that, in fact, uh, manage that. So if you have those two groups not talking to one another, you're going to have incorrect lead times. The second thing I'm seeing is they're not tracking it on a regular basis. So the best companies are looking at this on a monthly basis, uh, looking at what the anomalies are, what the outliers are, determining if those are going to remain or if they need to adjust their lead times. That's what the best companies are doing right now. Like you said, what are some of the best practices or, or examples you have of people um, trying to deal with variable lead times or unknown lead times? Um, the first is to put it on a scorecard. So uh, on a monthly basis, if you talk uh, to your vendors about lead times, uh, what the average lead times or the, mean, the mean, the, the min, and the max were, uh, discuss the outliers so that at least they're visible. Uh, in a lot of cases, the vendors aren't aware that they're deviating from their lead times. That's the first thing is to measure it. Uh, second is to discuss it. The third, Walmart is a, is a good example. They are very good at managing lead time. They hold their vendors to account. They schedule all of their receipts so that they know precisely when they're going to come in. You know, how do you get that information into an actionable state within your supply chain planning process? What I've seen, mostly it's manual. So one of the companies we work with, they they tracked, as I said before, on a monthly basis, they looked at all of their inbound purchase orders, and they looked at what their average lead times were, and they decided to select uh, an 80% rule. So if it was 80% of the time, uh, that's what they would use. So they wouldn't take the highest, they wouldn't take the lowest, and that's helped them a little bit. They're, they're trying to become more consistent with their lead times, but that's a rule. But one of the things I'm curious about is what types of technologies companies can employ to 
to automate this because to go in, if you're talking about tens of thousands of purchase order line items on a monthly basis, to track that on in some sort of a spreadsheet, uh, it's very labor intensive. Uh, so I'm curious uh, from your standpoint, what types of technologies can support this? Yeah, well, there's two specific things that we do in terms of uh, helping users figure out this lead time uncertainty or lead time variability. The first is just like you're saying, if they do some high level analysis and discover that, you know, 80% of the time it's 20 days, you know, another 5% of the time it's 25 days, another 15% of the time it's 75 days, that defines a curve. And you can then take that curve and put it into the, into the software and the software will calculate the uncertainty from that and use that uncertainty for planning and for setting the correct inventory buffers in the right places. And the second more automated way is to do what's known as lead time profiling. Take the receipt information, the purchase order and receipt information, and we'll crunch all the data for you and come out with a specific variability curve for that set of data and automatically put that back into the system as your lead time so that we put both pieces in. One is the discrete lead time, but also the variability around that lead time, which is very important. I think that that would be a huge step forward, and it's it's not something a lot of companies are using right now. Now, the other thing we talked about is, you know, you know you have a lead time problem, but what's the true cost? What's the true variability? How is that impacting you upstream and downstream? Actually, that's pretty easy because you can look at what the cost of lost sales are and you can directly relate it to, for instance, late purchase orders. Uh, conversely, you can very easily calculate the amount of additional inventory that's being carried because of inflated lead times. And you can build that into a scorecard. And in some cases, you can hold the vendors accountable if they're shipping stuff in early or they have, they're inconsistent in their lead times, which means you have to carry extra inventory. In some cases, you can go back and ask them to pay for it. Yep. And the other thing that I've seen is, like any other problem, there's going to be outliers. And to be able to find those outliers and work on those first is typically the biggest bang for the buck, right? Yeah, absolutely. And there's always going to be outliers, unless you can get to the Walmart model where you can hold your vendors completely accountable. Uh, it's going to happen. There's going to be weather issues. There's going to be shutdown issues. So you're not going to be able to get uh, 100% accuracy, I don't think, on lead times. But if you can get to 80%, you're well on your way. Yeah, and one of the things we can do with some of the tools is when you have that supply chain modeled, you can then play with the dials and say, okay, what's the horizon or what's the comparison between this uncertainty and the cycle time or this uncertainty in the inventory level or this uncertainty in the customer service, like you said, and essentially plot curves across the supply chain that will identify where the, you know, the biggest bang for the buck is. So then you can start targeting your improvement activities, right? So analytics becomes a very important part of this lead time challenge, don't you think? I think so. And I think you can also, I'm not sure how agility solves this, but seasonality issues. So you're not just looking backwards, but you can look forwards at what your lead time could be as well. Yeah, absolutely, because you'll find both. You'll find that in the high season, sometimes the lead time gets more variable, but you'll also find that in the high season, sometimes the lead time gets less variable because the volume is there. When you do that analytics, like you said, you, you come up with a time-phased variability across the, the future horizon, and that's very, very specific and very automated. Um, what are some of the case studies you've seen around this? Well, we worked with a, a, a retailer last year on, on this specific issue, and we found that after we worked with them on this and we developed what the percentage would be that would be applied to the lead times, uh, their in-stock position uh, went up, their inventories went down. Now, it took uh, some time because they had to track it, they had to document it, and they had to talk to their vendors, but that was a huge win for this particular retailer. Good. It's a process, right? It's not an event. So you're sitting down, you're getting the data straight, you're making sure it's correct in the system, and then you're going out and interfacing with your vendors or with your suppliers and figuring out what actions can be taken around that data. Right. But having the ability to do that within your software, I think, is a giant win because it's integrated with uh, time-based replenishment. Yep. The heavy lifting is done by the software, and it allows the users to look at what the output is and make the adjustments. It's not a huge event. 
and it can be done over and over and over. And I think that that's uh, huge for whether you're a, a, a manufacturer or you're a retailer. I think they can all use that. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a maturity level because most of the time I'll find that people are very good at sniffing out and understanding demand uncertainty, but they're not so good at the supply side, and that's a big blind spot for a lot of companies. And so this is probably a very topical conversation to have with your your clients. Absolutely, everybody's interested in this. Once they understand the costs associated with not managing lead times properly, they're all over this. All right. Thank you so much for for sharing with us today. I think this is an important topic. Thanks very much. So what are my three takeaways on this topic? Well, the goal here is to create consistent lead times. So we need to, one, take a scorecard approach. Monthly, review, identify outliers, hold your vendors accountable. Two, we need to tame that lead time variability by finding the lead time curve, by doing some lead time profiling, by putting some numbers around that lead time variability. And third, we need to perform some what-if scenario analysis. Instead of taking the lead times at face value and the variability at face value, how do we figure out what the impact of that variability is, and especially in a time phase manner, to match our seasons and our new product introduction curves. So my thanks to Bill for giving us these valuable insights into taming lead time variability. Supply Chain Horizons is sponsored by Legility. We also invite you to connect with us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter. So thanks again, and we'll see you next time on Supply Chain Horizons.